I don't care whether it's Republican or Democrat. That's not the issue. Uh, it was Lenin who said it so well. Lenin said, words are one thing, actions another. Of course, when Lenin wrote that, what he was telling his followers is that tell them what they want to hear. Don't worry about telling a lie. They want to hear lies, he said. Words are one thing. Tell them what they want to hear. Get elected. Come to power. When you're in power, he said, then do what you want to do. Words are one thing. Actions another. So he was advocating lying. Well, believe me, professional politicians understand this same technique. They would never come out and advocate it in public. They'd, they'd uh, deny it. But look at their records. Don't listen to their words. Look at their actions, and then you'll know what kind of a game they're playing with us. Ladies and gentlemen, in the theater of politics, words often dance to the tunes of hidden agendas. As Lenin wisely put it, words are one thing, actions another. Now let's venture beyond the rhetoric and delve into the depths where few dare to tread. Today, we're unveiling the veils of collectivism with the insights of none other than author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. Hey, we get a lot to cover. Let's get it. And that was the ideology of collectivism. Began to realize that the thing that was common to them all is something called collectivism. Now that's a word that um, is not very well used. It's not very uh, entrenched in the uh, vocabulary of most people today. But I found out that it was a very commonly used word about a century ago. People wrote a lot about collectivism, and the opposite of that would be individualism. Those are two words that are sort of uh, abandoned today. But in my view, I think they need to be uh, recaptured and uh, understood and used more. And I realized that communism and fascism, the so-called opposites, are merely variants of collectivism. They're the same thing. And they believe that the group is more important than the individual, for example. And the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. They believe that the state should be all-powerful and that uh, the people should obey the state for the greater good of the greater number and all of that sort of thing. Um, they believe that rights are uh, granted by the state. They're not, uh, they're not part of the human being. They're not, they're not God-given. They're not entrenched in his body and soul. They have to be granted by the state. All of these things, and you look at them one by one, communists and fascists and Nazis and socialists, they all believe that. So wherein lies the conflict, you see? And I began to question that. And I realized that it's partly a trick. It's a, in fact, I think it's a huge trick. It's a great scam because... You know, collectivism is a term seldom used, yet pervasively influential. Griffin peels back the layers, revealing the common ground shared by ideologies often deemed opposites. Now let's take a trip down the rabbit hole where left meets right, and individuality takes a back seat. The Democrats and the Republicans agree on something, so they don't want to talk about it in public debate because it reveals the fact that they're basically the same. They only talk about things on which they disagree. Turns out that the things on which they agree are the most important things. The things in which they disagree are relatively minor. So the things in which they agree are, for example, our foreign policy. They both agree that the desired goal eventually is to move the United States into world government. Not just any world government, but a world government based on the model of collectivism. In other words, big, powerful, centralized world government. If it were a world government based on the principles of freedom and uh, freedom of choice, freedom of culture, low intervention, if no intervention in the lives of normal human beings, it might be a wonderful thing, but that's not the kind of world government the left and the right have in mind. They're talking about total world government with all major decisions being made at the top and people at the bottom being essentially few, uh, in, living in a feudalist society, just serfs uh, and uh, peasants, basically, in a high-tech feudalism. And the left and the right both agree with that goal, and so they never discuss it in public debate. Another thing in which they agree is the dominance of the banking system in our economy and to a large extent in our politics. They both agree that the banks are supreme, that the banks must be protected, that the banks must be funded, they must be bailed out, they must not be allowed to fail. When the banks make bad loans to third world countries or if they make bad loans to large corporations, both the Republicans and the Democrats agree that we must come in with taxpayers' money, either tax money or inflation money, and we must bail out the banks. And we do that, they both agree, by giving the money to these corporations and giving the money to the third world countries so that they can continue to make interest payments to the banks. 
So those are two major issues, I would say, perhaps the, the largest issues we could possibly face. And um, so we find that Republicans and Democrats um, are in agreement on that. You might add one third, another third uh, topic, if you wish, and that is our, our role in the Middle East. Um, they both, both parties talk uh, alternately about, oh, we've got to end this war in, uh, in the Middle East, pull our troops home, you know, and all that sort of thing. But that's just rhetoric. You notice we go from one party to the other. The war continues. The war grows. The funding continues. So there we have three major issues, perhaps the three largest issues of all. And there's no debate between Republicans and, Democrat, and Democrats as to what to do. Or there may be some debate in rhetoric. They may give speeches. But when it's time to vote in Congress, there is no division between them at all. And this, this itself should be the biggest giveaway uh, as to what the reality of politics is today. If anybody that's got their eyes open, they ought to be able to see it just by examining those three issues. Oh yeah, the good old left and right apparently foes, yet clandestinely friends. They bicker over crumbs while dining together on the main course of world governance, and they clash swords on stage, yet behind the curtains, they play for the same team. It's a masterful illusion, a political fugazi. Because people even today are thinking that they have to choose between the right or the left, not realizing that no matter which way they go, they've accepted basically the same ideology underneath. Now it's true that the leaders of these groups, like the, the Stalins of the world, and the Adolf Hitlers of the world and the Mao Zedongs of the world and so forth, the, the leaders of these groups on left and right will fight each other and they will go to war with each other and there will be tremendous battles as we saw in World War II, for example. Uh, but what are they fighting over? Ideology? Not at all, because they agree on ideology. What they're fighting over is dominance. Who is going to rule? That's all they're fighting over. But once you get that picture, historically, it's not too difficult to see that that's the same thing going on even today. It's certainly going on in American politics. We have the left versus the right sort of embodied today in the Republican Party supposedly on the right and the Democrat Party supposedly on the left. Now here's a choice, isn't there? Well, why is it if this is such a choice that we go from Republicans to Democrats and then four years or eight years later we go back to, to Republicans again and we keep doing this? We've been doing this since World War I. How come the country keeps moving in the same direction all the time, deeper and deeper and deeper? deeper into collectivism, regardless of which party is in, in favor, because they both believe in collectivism. They both believe in big government. But their slogans are different, their leaders are different, but the poor voter out there trying to make sense of all this is, uh, he's tricked, he's stuck, he's trapped. And so this is the, the important thing to, uh, I think, understand that this left-right paradigm is a, uh, it's a political ploy. It works very well for those who know what they're doing. We find that the Republican Party and the Democrat Party both are pretty much in the, the hands of a, of a relatively small group of people with a membership of about 4,000. It's called the Council on Foreign Relations. These are the people that are really pulling the strings in both the Republican and the Democrat Party. And they've even written about it. You know, what's really crazy is the puppeteers, they're not in the shadows, they stand amidst us wearing the cloak of democracy, feeding us the illusion of choice. The question is, are we content being mere players in this grand design, or do we dare to peek behind the curtain? Another tactic, isn't it, that the opposition knows that the American people, any people in the world, will gladly give up their liberty and their comforts if it's in their mind a means of gaining security, protection against a dreaded threat of some kind. That's why regimes that are struggling to hold the loyalty of their people are very dangerous regimes because instinctively they know they have to go to war. They know that in time of war the people will rally behind their leaders no matter what because we're at war. And if we lose this war we'll be invaded, we'll be conquered by some dreaded enemy. And so Throughout history, uh, governments that are weak or losing influence over their own people uh, traditionally start wars and or they manufacture uh, false flag operations against themselves. They create their own enemies. They, be, they want to be victims so that they can rally their citizens behind them and anybody who wants to continue criticizing these leaders is then branded as being unpatriotic or possibly even um, branded as a traitor. So it's an old ploy. It's been done throughout history. Machiavelli wrote about it. It's everywhere, everywhere you look in history you see this ploy being used. And is it being used today in America? 
Absolutely it is, I'm sorry to say. Oh yeah, the good old eternal trade-off, freedom for security, the fear-mongering, the war drums, the false flags, all meticulously orchestrated, keeping us clinging to this promise of security while freedom slips right through our fingers. I do believe that when um, Ron Paul uh, ran for president and to everyone's amazement achieved such great support in spite of the roadblocks that were put in front of him and in spite of the total disinterest on the part of the major media so that he was uh, practically unknown to large segments of the people. Parenthetically, I would say that if the media had given Ron Paul anywhere near the same exposure they gave to the Republican and Democrat, I mean the, tr the old style Republican and Democrat party candidates, uh, I think he probably would have been elected. But anyway, um, that was sort of a phenomenal event that some somebody who did not have the endorsement of the establishment and who spoke so clearly on issues, uh, the very issues that we were talking about, the issues of the, the war, the issues of the economy and, the, and bailing out the banks and the Federal Reserve System and the issue of national sovereignty. These are issues that mainstream Republicans and Democrats don't want to touch because they agree on that. Ron Paul disagreed with what the Republican and Democrat Party were doing on that and so he spoke about it in spite of the fact that he was the only one talking about these issues. He got so much support. Tells me that there is a, a latent power. There's a latent awareness on the part of, on the part of the American people, just waiting to be tapped. I think those who are cr controlling the two-party system are very much afraid of that. They don't want that to be tapped. And that's why they are working so hard now to put controls on the internet because the message that Ron Paul was delivering was primarily delivered over the internet, not through the major channels of communication. So now we see uh, almost daily efforts on the part of the mainstream political figures to concoct different ways and different reasons and different excuses for putting controls on the internet. They're going to license people so that you can't even have a blog, they say, unless you have a license from the government. They want to put filters on the search engines so that you can't even look up certain words and things like that. Actually, I think what they're trying to do here in this country is pretty much imitate what they're already doing in China, for example. They, they really admire that system in China. Our own figures here in this country, although they may you know, speak with scorn about a closed society in China, they're doing everything they can to imitate it. So that's one of the realities we have to look at. So what does this mean for the future? I think that as long as the internet can be kept open and free, it, it uh, bodes very well for us because I think we do have at last a chance to get around the mainstream media. But I think that if the governments of the world, and particularly in our own government, if they're successful in putting legal restrictions on and clamping down on the internet, I'm afraid that the, the um, chances of, a, of a, um, a maverick moving against the establishment become very, very small indeed. Bitcoin reminds me of this, but if you go back to 08 and 2012, amidst all the, the chaos of the great financial crisis, there was a spark of rebellion that was in the Ron Paul movement, and it was a flicker of awareness that resonated through the silence, evidence that the narrative can be challenged and that the script can be rewritten. So how are you going to how are you going to fight this great drift toward global government with all of these powerful people at the top and nobody on the street cares? The answer is that all movements of history have always been determined by less than 3% of the population. You don't need everybody out there. In fact, uh, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. Never happened before in history and it won't happen now and certainly won't happen in the future. 3% or less of the population are always the movers and the shakers. If you can reach 3% of the people who really care and who really have the mindset and who are willing to make the sacrifices and the dedication to this task, it can be done. And the guy next door will continue to push his lawnmower and he'll go whichever way the system goes. It's always been that way. So we don't need to be discouraged by the fact that not everybody is taking an interest. Our job is to find that one, two, or 3% of the people who do care, get the message to them, join forces with them, and then we have to come to power. Coming to power means we have to get into politics, we have to get back into the media centers, we have to communicate this information to everybody we can, we have to be, let our voices be heard in the, great, uh, in, in the great power centers of society, the political parties, the labor unions, the church organizations, the media centers, and so forth. This is where we, the 3% or less, must go to work. This is where we're going to find the battle. This is where we're going to engage the enemy, and this is where we're going to recapture 
all the respective countries of the world. You know, we all know the article Corey Clipston of Swan, the race to avoid the war. The, these two coincide perfectly, but it's really driving the point home that it's not about the masses. It's about the ignited few who dare to challenge the narrative. That small percent yet is a powerful force capable of steering the tide. But the question remains, are we part of the 3% or the silent majority? These people are not stupid. Uh, they knew that uh, there would be opposition to their plans as they reach the end of the game. They know that as people begin to lose their economic freedom and uh, they know that as one crisis after another uh, descends upon them, there's going to be opposition. And so they planned on this a long time ago. And I think um, what we're really looking at is, um, I think Alex Jones called it the end game. We're, we're approaching the end game and they have a plan for that and that is to um, to institute martial law because as people become upset they go into the streets they demonstrate and eventually they become unruly eventually they become violent and eventually they start breaking windows eventually somebody gets hurt eventually somebody gets killed eventually there's martial law and that really is what they really want because they want an excuse for martial law. All collectivist systems eventually deteriorate into a police state because it's the only way you can hold it together. So are they worried about people becoming aware? Um, I think they are not because they've been planning on it. It, it, let's say it this way. They're certainly not surprised by it. As we continue to inch closer to the end game, the stakes are higher, the plots are thicker, martial law, a term once alien now lurks around the corner. It's a chess game and the pawns are on the move. So we come to the sad conclusion that the United States is no longer the country it was. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Uh, the old methods of writing a letter to your congressman don't work anymore. It's time for a fundamental change. And that's not going to happen, though, until more and more Americans, first of all, wake up to the reality of their present plight. They were still living in a dream world, still reading in our history books, you know, looking at pictures of George Washington and his white socks and so forth and the signing of the Declaration, and we think it's still that way. It's not that way, folks. And so people live in this dream world. The first step is to realize what we're really living under, what kind of a system we're really living under, and then to go back and figure out what kind of a system do we want to restore. And I think restoring the concepts in our original Constitution is a great step forward, not backward, but forward. We've been going backwards toward monarchy ever since World War I. We have to go forward now to the past, if I can coin that phrase. And, uh, but that's not going to happen until a large number of, of Americans understand that it has to happen. So that's, what is that, an optimistic or a pessimistic view? I think it's an optimistic view in the long run. It's a pessimistic view in the short run because nothing like that is going to happen by November. It's not going to happen in the next election. Americans are always focused on, well, how can we make this happen quickly so I can go back to my golf game? You know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. If I, I'll become active maybe for a few months and I'll, I'll vote for a candidate or something, but don't drag this thing out, please, because I'm too busy. They want to know how we can turn this all around by the next election. It can't be done by the next election, but it can be done. That's the optimistic part. I think if we have a realistic view of the political process, and we know that uh, it takes sometimes a generation or two for really important changes to happen. And if we understand that and accept it, and accept our role in being responsible for making it happen, then you can go to sleep at night and say, by golly, I'm really doing something about this, and I am making a difference, and it will happen. Amidst all the gloom, the beacon emerges, and it's right there on the horizon. Bitcoin, not just a digital currency, it is the revolution. It's a defiance against the shackles of financial oppression, offering a glimmer of hope in the storm of orchestrated control. Bitcoin's decentralized essence challenges the very core of collectivist financial dominion. It presents an open ledger, a transparent arena where power returns 
returns to the people. No longer can the puppeteers manipulate the strings of financial control unseen. Bitcoin is a statement, a statement that echoes through the halls of centralized power, shaking the foundations of their constructed realities. Bitcoin whispers the ancient call of liberty, offering a pathway back to financial sovereignty, back to freedom. Like any powerful narrative, it's not without its foes, and as we stride towards financial emancipation, the forces of control sharpen their blades, and the battle is not just over money, it's over the narrative of what money represents, a tool of freedom or a weapon of control. So, as we navigate through the turbulent waters of modern political theater, Bitcoin is sailing a vessel of hope amidst the sea of orchestrated chaos, and Bitcoin isn't just uh, a crypto. It is a crusade, a crusade towards reclaiming our inherent right to financial freedom, towards a narrative not scripted by unseen hands, but penned by the collective ink of individual sovereignty. Self-custody is the revolution, and Simply Bitcoin Originals are powered by the Bitcoin way. They are your IT team in the Bitcoin world. They can help you with your journey if you need help with wallets and nodes, inheritance planning, no KYC purchases, how to buy Bitcoin, accepting Bitcoin payments, collaborative custody, multi-sig, and more. They got you covered. Schedule a free 30-minute call today using that link below. You know, Bitcoin's consensus is like a journey back to the essence of our constitution. And that is not going to be a sprint, but a marathon. It's going to be about waking up from the dream, waking others up, and facing harsh realities and taking the reins of change. It's a battle of endurance, of resilience, and most importantly, of awareness. As we draw the curtain on today's narrative, remember the stage is vast, the script is not set in stone, and it's about time we become the directors of this political theater. And maybe, just maybe, with tools, named namely Bitcoin, we can flip the script. Yeah, yeah, it's time to call bullshit. Bullshit on what? Every fucking thing.